Okay, so we're all here for real-time visibility using the client statement cache to troubleshoot open edge performance issues, right? Everybody's in the right room? Okay, nobody's getting up and rushing out. We're gonna talk about three main things here. Uh, what's the user doing at any given moment in time? Uh, how do you set up the client statement cache? And what is the impact of using the client statement cache? So it's three distinct topics that we're gonna, gonna go through here. So what's the impact? Now that you're all sold on how easy it is to set up and, and how much fun it's going to be, you're obviously going to be wondering, does this have any performance impact on my uh, system? Or is it, er, nobody's worried about that? <laughs> so it's a great feature, um, but obviously there's no free lunch. Um, everything, everything that's good in life costs you something. So we're going to talk about what that cost is. First of all, there's memory. Uh, so in order to enable the client statement cache, you need to consume some memory uh, because the, the cache itself has to be stored somewhere. Uh, at DB Startup, uh, you'll have 28 bytes that are allocated uh, per user plus the number of servers plus two. Uh, you'll have some shared memory that's allocated at Startup, and this is to make the client statement cache available. This doesn't increase or change because you're uh, turning it on or off, this is just what the memory impact of the feature is. And then when you enable a connection, you use 32 additional bytes of memory <clears throat> plus 256 bytes for the stack, so that's another 288 bytes. Uh, so all in, if you have a system with roughly 2,000 connections, uh, you're going to use memory on the order of a megabyte. So this is not a really big footprint feature. You're not using gobs and gobs and gobs of memory. So you can feel good about it from a memory perspective. You don't have to worry that you're going to run out of memory because you've enabled this feature. Uh, if you do see this error message here about unable to allocate shared memory, that means that it was not, uh, that the dash MXS parameter didn't have enough free memory to put additional users in there. But that, with this kind of a footprint, you're very unlikely to see that. You may see it, and if you do, you need to increase MXS. Uh, the other thing that happens is that there's a temporary file that gets created. Uh, so if the information that you're requesting exceeds the 256 bytes, then the CST file will be generated. Uh, and you get one per connection, and it has this complicated name with the path to the database with tildes replacing slashes or backslashes, uh, then the process ID, the user number, and it ends with .cst. Uh, you don't have a startup parameter for the database to control the location. You have to go into Promon uh, and change it there. Uh, by default, it's going to be written to the process's current directory. So if your um, system is set up in a way that you change the directory of the process before the process starts executing, you need to make sure that you have write permission in that directory. Or you need to use the feature to redirect the CST files to some other directory, but you need to have write permission wherever that CST file is, is being generated. Uh, if you change it with Promon, uh, it works for future connections, but for existing connections, it will still try to use the current directory. Uh, you can only change it once per Promon session, and after that, Promon will just tell you what the value you set it to is, unless you get out of Promon and go back in. Uh, the CST files are written by any self-service or shared memory client and by the remote client or SQL server process. So those MPro serve or SQL serve 2 processes are the ones that are writing the, uh, the files. They're the ones who you need to be aware of where the uh, current directory is and whether or not you have permissions. Uh, very, very old open edge releases had some bugs. So, you know, 16, 20 years ago. Not everything was quite perfect. Uh, like you had to have right permission or uh, you might end up holding a latch and then nobody would be able to get anything done. That was kind of inconvenient. Uh, the user latch will become very active if CSC is enabled globally. Uh, so there's a latch called USR, which is usually used just when you log in and log out. But once you start using client statement cache, it gets used every time that cache gets updated. Uh, it does not report on temp tables. So 
if you're hoping to get information on what's happening with temp tables through the client statement cache, you're going to be disappointed. You won't get that information. Only database tables. Uh, and the VST fields cannot be written to on a replication target. So if you're trying to enable CSC on replication, you have to go through ProMine. You can't do it with uh, the VSTs. Um, and of course, it doesn't really track anything that's not related to the database. The stack itself, if you go for the full stack or the SQL statement, you're limited to 32,000 bytes. Not 32K, 32,000 with zeros. Um, <clears throat> the procedure names that you get from the uh, statement are the procedure names that you gave to a run statement. So they don't, they don't expand the probe path for you or anything like that. It's just whatever you, you said to the run statement. So if you get her procedure names. Uh, as I mentioned, the 4GL line numbers are the debug list line numbers. So you have to compile with the debug list option, like that shows right there. And that'll give you the source that you need to, to search for whatever the line number is. If you see line minus one, that is the cleanup at the end of the procedure. So that's things like releasing buffers that weren't properly scoped and things of that nature. Uh, the timestamp uh, on the uh, cache statement, so the cache statement, you get the, the line number, you get the procedure name, you also get a timestamp. So you know how old that is, uh, which can be interesting if you have a lot of activity, you get a for each that's uh, going through 10 million lines of our 10 million records, the timestamp tells you how long it's been doing that. That timestamp will not change even if your 4GL code iterates in a loop and executes the same statement again. Uh, so if you have uh, the classic do while true, find first customer, and you'll only have one statement. The timestamp will never change there even though you're repeatedly fetching the first, first customer. And of course, a client cannot successfully monitor itself. That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You follow, it's kind of like trying to bootstrap your way into space. It doesn't really work. Uh, with SQL, uh, because the SQL engine already has the select statement and the, uh, the request from the SQL client, it doesn't actually have to do anything extra. It's already there. So that's, that is actually a free lunch. Um, the line number is always zero. Uh, and the SQL statements are often very long, so you're a lot more likely to use the CST uh, overflow file. Uh, there's a lot of, you, you know, if you look at SQL code, you see things that are pages long. Uh, you know, so that's, that's much more likely to exceed that 256 bytes than the 4GL query will. Uh, SQL statements also often have formatting. Uh, so line breaks, tabs, all those kinds of things will be in the SQL statement. So if you're writing some VST code to export um, what's going on there, you need to be aware that you have to look for multiple line uh, entries, that it's not just a simple field with, with no formatting in it. Uh, with SQL clients, there, as you might guess, uh, there is no discernible difference with or without CSC enabled. So you turn it on, turn it off, doesn't seem to matter to the SQL engine. I thought, I was kind of hoping, well, not really hoping, but I was kind of thinking that writing that CST file might have at least a noticeable impact, that there might be a couple of milliseconds difference, but in fact, there's not any difference to be found, where it was so, so far down in the noise that you just couldn't, couldn't measure it. Shared memory. Uh, so these are the four GL clients. Um, <clears throat> We have a table here. It's a bit of an eye chart for those of you in the back. Sorry, um, but you should you should come up closer. <laughs> um, what you see in the in the charts here is that um, a repeated find no lock, like we were talking about, has an impact of about five to ten percent, depending on whether or not you do just the top of the stack or the full stack. So if you only do the top of the stack, the impact is about 5%. If you do the full stack, then you get about a 10% performance impact from it. Uh, that's when you repeat the same find statement over and over and over. When you have different find statements, so you got find first customer, find customer three, find customer 12, but they're each individual lines of 4GL code, then that starts 
changing into a mixed fund statement, and that's where you have a significant impact. Now your impact is on the 40% range. So you're, you're really hurting throughput at that point. Uh, for four each, no lock, the uh, impact is about 3% for top of stack. So it's very low, very low impact for anything that's a query. Uh, then I wanted to test whether or not having a very long path uh, which would cause these, the uh, CSV file to be used uh, would have much of an impact. So I created a, a directory structure that was very deep, had long file names, filled up the, uh, the stack that way, and made a much larger stack to go through. And the differences are noticeable. So you go from 5 and 10 to 12 and actually 12% improvement in performance <laughs> to, and a 25% hit. Um, and then with the other cases, it, it's even worse. So making the path long does tend to make it worse. Now these, these guys that were positive are really weird. I don't know why it got better, uh, but I, I ran the tests over and over and over and I kept having that pattern of actually improving performance with long, deep paths. It makes no sense at all. Um, yes? With the prefetch query, were you using the prefetch parameters? So Rod's asking if uh, with the uh, for each no lock, was I using the prefetch parameters to support that? Uh, since these tests were actually run in OpenEdge 12, those parameters are on by default, so the answer is yes. I did, uh, I don't know if I can't remember if I have a slide about that, but I, I did actually run the tests on 10, 11, and 12, and the results are roughly equivalent across all versions. There's, there's no major difference in any of the version, versions. Uh, yeah. So for remote clients, uh, so those were self-service clients, uh, remote clients, uh, the impacts were fairly similar in terms of the, the mixed find is once again, uh, where we have the biggest impact is 40% kind of an impact, 40 to 50%. Uh, 4-H is not really all that much of an impact, uh, and prefetch numrex, kind of to Rob's question, if you do increase it, will have an impact on the 4 eaches because you're packing more records into each of those queries. Uh, so the, the change in the statement happens less frequently, the information has to go back and forth to the server less often. So why are mixed finds so bad? Remember, a mixed find is when it's two very different statements in the 4GL. So you, you're not repeating the same statement over and over, you're going from one find statement to a different find statement. So you might be doing find order, find order line, something like that. That will cause a change, but if, uh, if you keep repeating the same one, then, then there is no change. Um, so when you have CSC enabled in a client-server scenario, uh, what happens is you get two additional network messages. So if you think about what progress does in client-server, when data has to go back and forth, there's a request, there's a response, and then there's a release of the cursor for a find. Uh, and we're adding two messages here. One is saying, uh, well, actually, I didn't actually look at the network message, but I think it's saying, tell me what, um, what statement this is, and the other one is saying it's this statement. Uh, so you have these two additional messages, which basically doubles the number of messages for find statements. So it's not really much of a surprise that your throughput is cut in half, right? Doing twice as much work, your throughput is going to suffer. And the other thing that happens is that the user latch gets locked. So you have a little bit of latch contention, a little bit of latch activity going on there. Relative to the network activity, that's relatively small but it, it is an impact. Uh, and <clears throat> without a large result set, because you're only getting one record back, so you can't take the latency that you're getting from those additional messages and quote unquote amortize it over a large result set. So your throughput suffers a lot more because the impact of the latency only has one record to feel it. Uh, and one way to think of it is that the behavior of find statements is really a proxy for a lot of bad code. So you'll see the same sort of behavior if you have a for each share lock or a for each exclusive lock. Anything that is not a for each no lock 
or a related statement like the uh, dynamic versions of for each, uh, is going to have this kind of behavior. So if you have crappy code that doesn't pay attention to locking uh, and you have share locks all over the place, the client statement cache is going to bring that out in spades. Um, so you don't want to use it in an environment where your code is really bad. Uh, so in spite of my jokes about bad code, most of you do not have code that's that bad. So for, to recap, the uh, impact of client statement cache for SQL clients, there is no discernible impact. Just couldn't find, couldn't find anything pro or con for SQL clients. Uh, for shared memory, the impact is pretty small. Yes, there is some impact, but it's not that big, especially for the four H's. Uh, and if you think about what you do with a client statement, um, you know, you're, you're not doing tens of thousands of record fetches with finds in a short period of time. You're doing a couple of finds and then you're doing some work or you're going out and you're putting together a, a more structured query. So, you know, a couple of finds here and there, you know, there's a lot of them, but it, the performance impact isn't necessarily that bad. Uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, if you do have a lot of find statements, uh, it might be a severe impact. So one of the possible mitigations there is to move that find code to use temp tables instead. Because also, if you think about it, um, what are you doing with those little finds? Well, a lot of cases, not all, but a lot of cases, what you're doing is you're looking up read-only control data. So you have some control tables in your database, which are helping you to figure out uh, what company number is this and uh, what, what's the parameterization for such and such a feature. And you hit those tables over and over and over, but you never write to them. You're just reading from them. So if you move those tables into temp tables on the client side uh, and only, only uh, refresh them periodically, you can eliminate an awful lot of client server traffic and improve your performance and not suffer so much from uh, anything from the client statement cache. So here are some uh, enhancement requests. If you go to uh, ideas uh, or openedge.ideas.aha.io, we've got two, four, six things that you could vote for that would make the client statement cache better, um, <clears throat> including things like, hey, shouldn't we be able to update the replication targets? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, having some DB startup parameters, adding a VST field to uh, enable all, or at least see what the status of our all future uh, clients going to have CFC on. Um, uh, you can increase the threshold for the, for the in-memory cache. 256 bytes is really trivial. Uh, today, uh, 1K would be cool, 4K would be even better. Um, <clears throat> reduce or eliminate the user latching. Uh, and try to do something about the number of messages going back and forth in the client server protocol. That would, be, that would be great if we could consolidate those somehow. Okay. Now, there's one more feature. So you may have noticed that I said a couple of times that this only applies to database statements. And that's kind of a problem for some people because not everything is the database. You have 4GL code too, and sometimes you have 4GL code that does slow things. <laughs> so there's another feature called ProGet Stack. Uh, and what ProGet Stack um, is, it was also introduced with 10.1c. Well, it wasn't introduced with 10.1c. Variations of it existed uh, as far back to, is my purple here? I think they existed as far back as uh, version 8. Uh, but they were inconsistent, and sometimes there would be a release that didn't support the, the uh, ProTrace feature. Uh, it became permanently available in 10.1c, uh, and what it does is it allows you to ask for a pro, uh, ProTrace from any running process, any running 4GL process. So you use ProGetStack, you get the process ID, and you get a ProTrace.pid in the uh, working directory. And that will tell you the same information that the CSC tells you, but without the restriction that it's only the database uh, statements. So if you're in a loop calculating the value of pi, uh, it will tell you that you're on the line that is uh, doing some exponentiation or something. 
And the output looks kind of like this. If you've never looked at a protrace, uh, you get some great information. You get the command line arguments, you get the startup parameters, you get all this information here about the uh, uh, stack dump from progress. And then you get the ABL stack trace. Uh, so it tells you what the, what the top line of the stack was, what line number you're on, just like it did in the client statement cache stuff. Uh, and it gives you a list of any persistent procedures or classes that you might have open, what the pro path was, and so on and so forth. Great information for, for debugging. So there are some differences between CSC and ProGet stack. Uh, so CSC is centralized. It's in the database, so as a DBA, you can enable uh, CSC. You don't need to have any special privileges beyond whatever it takes to be a DBA. You don't necessarily have to be root. You don't necessarily have to be an administrator on a Windows machine. You might have to be. That will depend on how you were set up, but it's not a requirement. Um, <clears throat> you can enable CSC, and then you have to wait for some sort of a database statement. So CSC never looks backwards. It's always looking forward. Uh, and then there might be some network traffic, so that's kind of the downside. Uh, ProGet stack has some pros and cons too. So ProGet stack does not work with PAS OE. Multi threading is a bit of a problem there. Um, it reports whatever is running right now, that's great. Uh, but it does require local access. So you have to have access to whatever machine it is that progress is running on which if you're in a client-server environment, can be problematic. You may not have access to the end user's PC. You have access to the database server, but you don't have access to all those uh, client's systems. Uh, and you would need administrator privilege, so you would need to be able to log in as admin to run the ProGet stack. Uh, and it appends the output to a local file, which means that now you've got to go collect all those files from all the various machines that they might be on. And that's kind of inconvenient compared to just being able to sit on the database server, launch a query against the database, go into Promon, see what's happening. So you have a lot more chasing around after things if you're using uh, ProGet stack. 